For the rest of us, go ahead and open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 is where we are going to be. If you're a guest with us, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. If you're checking us out online, welcome to you as well. And we just want you to know as we begin every message uh, that we believe that the Bible we are opening right now is the inspired word of God himself. We believe that God has revealed himself to us through his word so we can know him and we can love him and we can worship him. And and we believe that these words are authoritative because they were written by the one who has ultimate authority. And so what I'm going to say today doesn't matter unless it agrees with what God's word says. I want you to know that right from the beginning. Just because I'm saying it doesn't, make it doesn't make it relevant, doesn't make it important. What matters is what the Bible says. We want to collectively be a church that says, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the Bible says. And so that's why we want you to see God's word for yourself today. Grab the Bible in front of you and turn to page 983 if you didn't bring your own. Get it on the app on your phone. We'll have the words on the screen as well. I can mess this up. But God's word always gets it right. We want to be all about God's word today. And and, and we've been going through uh, this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae with a purpose, which is that we would see the supremacy and the centrality of Christ in everything. Because we believe that's our only hope. We believe our only hope in the struggle that is this earthly life is having more of Christ. In order to fulfill our purpose in this world, we don't ultimately need more money or more vacations or more prominence or more time. We need more of Jesus. Do you believe that? We need more of Jesus. We need to be so filled with him that we wouldn't have room for anything else, so focused on him that we wouldn't be distracted by anything else, that we would so value him that we wouldn't that we wouldn't worship anything else, that we would value Christ in such a way that rather than pushing him to the margins of our lives, that he would be at the very center of all of our lives. And if we don't believe and and embrace the passage that we are looking at this morning, then it will be impossible for this purpose that we have for this series to be accomplished. Because this is the passage that serves as the very foundation of this letter. So so Paul is writing to this church of, of relatively new believers who were at risk of being misled by false teaching that diminished the significance of Jesus. And so after his initial greeting to the church and and thanking God for them and and praying for the Colossian church, verse 15 begins sort of the body of this letter, if you will. And and, and rather than launching off and, and, and criticizing the false teaching that was present in the church, Paul instead chooses to elevate the person of Jesus with probably the most Christ exalting paragraph in all of Scripture. Uh, And and I think it would be hard to overstate the stakes this morning. Because if our our minds and our hearts don't don't know and elevate Jesus above everything else, we don't stand a chance against the philosophies and the practices of this world. Uh, If my kids and if your kids don't love and value Jesus above everything else, they don't stand a chance Right? If the Colossian church didn't see the supremacy and the centrality of Christ in everything, they didn't have a chance. And, and, and knowing everything that was on the line, Paul writes this paragraph under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And if, if you were to make a list of the top three greatest paragraphs in all of the Bible without including Colossians 1, 15, 15 through 20, then I would just humbly suggest that your list is wrong. <laughs> that doesn't make me right, but that's just my suggestion, uh, because that's, that, that's what I think. I think top three, this is in my top three of the greatest paragraphs in all the Bible, because this passage and what it reveals about Jesus is just so significant. And, and it's so significant that we're actually going to come back to this uh, during the Christmas season, and we're going to look at some of, these, some, some of these titles for Jesus one at a time to help us think through Christ and his coming. Uh, but if, if you want to know Jesus and, and how he's described in the New Testament, then you picked a great Sunday to be here. 
This passage is all about Jesus and who he is, and it's all about authority. Who's in charge? That's a really important question, right? That impacts so much of our lives. Who's in charge, and who should be in charge? And so Paul has just said that the church has been delivered from the domain of darkness, from the authority of darkness, and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. They've been transferred into the reign of Jesus. They're under the authority of Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and that leads right into verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He might be superior, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's key. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen? Oh, that is so good. That is so good. I hope you love the word of God. Most people see two sections in this paragraph. And it's all about the preeminence of or the superiority of Jesus. And and the first half attests to Jesus' superiority in in creation, and the second half attests to his superiority in salvation, or in the new creation. It's Jesus over everything, uh, which, which means that the claims of this passage are completely dependent on the deity of Christ, on Jesus being fully God. If Jesus is not God, then Paul, in writing this paragraph, is a heretic and an idolater. Because God commanded that we should have no other gods before him. And that you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only should you serve. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here, Paul credits the creation of the world to who? To Jesus. He he ascribes to Jesus superiority in everything. And he is right to do so because in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It's all about Jesus has to be deity in order for this to be true. He has to be God in order for this to be right. We rightly worship and submit to Jesus because he is fully God And yet he became fully man as the image of the invisible God as verse 15 begins. Jesus is the the image of the invisible God. And that's interesting because what does Genesis tell us? Genesis tells us that we are made in the image of God. You could say that we are made in the image of the invisible God. We have personhood will, and emotions. But we know that we don't possess all of the incommunicable attributes that make God, God. We are not all-knowing, all-powerful, always-present, transcending time. I don't think any of you would claim any of those things, right? We're not. We're not. And, And the image of God on us is further obscured by our sin and our rebellion. So, so you have a God who is holy, and, and we have all sinned and, and fallen short of his glory. So what we are left with is we have a God who is invisible, right? You, you can't see him. God is spirit, not physical. And the billions of his visible image bearer, bearers, that's, that's you and me, are pretty poor representations of him in and of ourselves. Enter Jesus. He is not in the image of God. No, he is the image of the invisible God. So we were created to be shadows. Jesus is the reality. If you want to know what God looks like, 
look at Jesus. If you want to know about his character, look at the character of Jesus. If you, if Jesus was the visible of what was formerly invisible. Jesus made the nature and being of God perfectly known. He doesn't just represent God, he manifests God. And Jesus did so by entering into this created world. But don't let his humble entry fool you. He is the firstborn of all creation. He's the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. Which, which is to say that Jesus is above or Jesus is before all creation. People misuse this verse to try to claim that Jesus was the first being God created because we think about firstborn like you think about your firstborn child right but but firstborn here is not indicating first in order like the order of your children but rather first in significance first in rank and I don't just say that because it's convenient the context makes this clear because look at the first word of verse 16 after he says he's the firstborn of all creation he says for Okay, so what follows in verse 16 is an explanation of Jesus being the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16 is an explanation of him being the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. So, so think about this. <laughs> if Jesus is a created being, Paul's explanation for what it means for him to be a firstborn is illogical, right? Because if you're the firstborn, a created being, then you can't create everything, right? But he says he's the firstborn of all creation, and he's the creator of all things, right? Firstborn means that Jesus is more significant and superior to everything else in creation. There's other examples of this if you're interested. You can just write down in your notes Psalm 89, 27, Psalm 89, 27, speaking of David, it talk, God says, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And obviously David wasn't firstborn in order, right? But he was superior to all other kings in Israel. It was talking about his rank, not his order. David was not firstborn in order, but he was elevated to a position of authority. Jesus was not created at all. He was not created at all. He created it all. And he is Lord over all. And get used to hearing the word all, by the way, because seven times that word is used in this paragraph because nothing escapes underneath the umbrella of Jesus' superiority. If there is anything in creation that you treat as more significant than Jesus, if there's anyone's words that you value more than Jesus' words, if there's anyone's desires that you value more than Jesus' desires, then your values are wrong. He is before all things, and he created all things. Jesus is before, and Jesus is the means of creation. And this is a good time to mention that Jesus being creative is different than us being creative. Because creative people in this world are dependent on materials that are already there. At best, they can rearrange things to make something else. As Piper says, people rearrange chemicals and make medicine. Or they rearrange molecules and make an atomic bomb. Or arrange materials to make a house or a car. Jesus is creative in that he makes something out of nothing. He couldn't rearrange anything. There was nothing there. He was before all things. The one who is before all things created out of all things, something out of nothing. And if you wonder, what does Paul mean when he says that Jesus created all things? He explains, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. This is interesting.
that felt like 30 minutes for me. It was probably like eight seconds, but wow, that, whew, man, okay. Here's the interesting thing. When you make a list of people of things that, G, that God created, right, when you teach your kids about creation, what examples do you give that Jesus created? You say he created the sun, the moon, the stars, he created water, he created land, he created animals, he created people. That's our list, right? That's a list of things that, that God created. Paul's list is a little different of that when he's giving examples of what Jesus created. He says he created things in heaven and things on earth, so our usual list certainly applies here, but then he goes further. He says Jesus created everything that is visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So no matter what, what about this exception you can come up with, everything owes its existence to Jesus. And as such, he is superior over every ruler and every authority in both the physical world and the spiritual domain. There is nothing in heaven or on earth where God says, how in the world did that get there? <laughs> right? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing that happens. No ruler that rises up. No evil that takes place. There's nothing that, that is in existence that God says, well, how did that happen? Like, how in the world did that get there? That never happens. He created it all. And so no matter how much an evil authority tries to flex its muscle and rebels against its created purpose, it is all under the authority of King Jesus. Oh, and it is held together by Jesus because verse 17 tells us that he holds all things together. Jesus didn't just create and then throw his hands up in the air and just let it go, right? He didn't just spin the world like a top and then sit and watch to see how long it would last. No, he is a hands-on God. He sustains the world that he created. R.C. Sproul said, there are no maverick molecules. Every little thing is held together and in place by Jesus. The reason gravity continues to keep your feet on the ground, the reason the sun rose today, and it was beautiful, by the way, the reason the sun rose today and your phone already knows what time it will rise tomorrow, the reason the planets are constantly in motion but never collide, the reasons the oceans are where they are and the mountains are where they are, the reason I don't fly apart into a million fragments right now is dependent on Jesus who holds all things together. He is before creation. He is the means of creation. And Jesus is the ends of creation. Read verse, the end of verse 16 again. All things were created through him and for him. I've shared this illustration before, but one of the joys of parenting is when your toddler colors you a picture. Wouldn't you agree, parents? It's pretty great. Uh, and sometimes my kids, I have to admit, sometimes my kids think that their work is fridge-worthy and they need a reality check on that. Right? Uh, when you have four kids, you have to earn fridge space with your work. You can't just like color something in 30 seconds and get it up there for six months. That's not how it works in our house. Like, Put some effort into this, guys, okay? But I love it. I love it when Zayden will show me a picture, he's three, and I'll act like it's the best thing I'll, I've ever seen. Like, oh my goodness, that's so great, right? And he's so proud of himself, and then I'll ask him, Zayden, buddy, who did you make that for? And he'll be like, it's for you, daddy, right? That's the best. Like, yes, I'm loved by my three-year-old son. Or it's for mommy, that's good too, right? That's good too. And if we had the chance to look with Jesus at everything he's made, at all of his creation. If Jesus took us to the most beautiful mountains and waterfalls and galaxies, and, and it was literally the best thing that we've ever seen, and, and, and we said, Jesus, wow, you made that? Like, look at you go, Jesus. That's incredible. That's amazing. And then if you ask Jesus, who did you make that for? What would Jesus say? He would say, I made it for me. You made, it, you made it for me? No, 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 no. I made it for myself. All things were created through him and for him. 
They were created for him. We, and that is so different from how our world looks at creation, isn't it? Right? And these, these, these verses have, have been so transformative to my worldview because we live in this, it's all about me, it's for me society. We, we naturally see life through the lens of what does this mean for me? It's my life and I can do what I want. I've decided I need to put myself first. I need to focus on me. I need to focus on myself. I need to do what's best for me, looking out for number one. But if all things were created for Jesus and you and I were created by Jesus, that means that I wasn't created for me. I was created for him. And you were created for him too. And, and that leads to one perceived problem and one real problem. This reality that we were created by him and for him leads to a perceived problem and a real problem. The perceived problem is, is that some look at passages like this and accuse God of being an egomaniac. Right? He's just all about himself and it's a flaw in his character. That's the perceived problem. But the real problem with us being created by him and for him is that we have all failed to fulfill our purpose as created beings. We are not on our own right with the one we were created for and who is superior over all things, which is a precarious place to be. This passage is not good news if you are not right with Jesus. He is superior over it all. And the answer to both the perceived problem and the real problem is that Jesus is not only superior over creation, he is also superior in salvation. Verses 18 through 20, Paul narrows his focus from all of creation to the, the new creation, those who are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, saying this in verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The, the superiority of Christ in salvation and is what we're going to think about for a few minutes. And once again, you will see that Jesus is before, he is the means, and he is the ends. He is the head of the body, the church. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this description, but I enjoyed this observation from H.B. Charles, and I just wanted to pass it along. He said, anything without a head is dead, but anything with more than one head is a monster. I think that's a quality observation. Jesus is the sole authority over his universal church, unrivaled in his significance and superiority, and that is a very good thing, because without him, the church is dead. But if human leaders see their words as authoritative as well as Jesus' word, that turns into a monster, and no one likes those. But more importantly to the flow of thought, if we have all failed to fulfill our purpose from verse 18, living for the one we were created for. If we are all sinful rebels against Jesus' authority, how is there a group that make up the body that Jesus is now the head of? How did we get to verse 18? It's because of what verse 18 goes on to say, which is that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. This begins to answer both the perceived problem and the real problem. Jesus, in his humanity, experienced what awaits us all, a physical death. The difference, of course, being that he was not experiencing the consequences for his own sin on the cross, but rather the consequences for our sin. And unlike us, Jesus had the power to rise again. But the purpose of his resurrection was not to flaunt the fact that he could overcome death and we couldn't. The picture of Jesus getting out of the grave is not, ha ha, I did it and you didn't, right? You're still in the ground. That's not, that's not the picture. Uh, uh, my, my, my children are, um, they're sinners, okay? <laughs> and I love reminding them of that. <laughs> I am too. My, my children are sinners. And as such, they enjoy celebrating accomplishments at the expense of their other siblings. I'm sure none of you did this as kids. It's just my kids, right? But if, if, 
if they do something or get something that the other children didn't, they let them know about it, right? <laughs> I won and you lost. And if Jesus was the only born from the dead, he rose, but we all stay in the ground. Ha ha, I won and you lost. He would be superior, but not in a way that helps us. The accusation of egomania might have some credence. But Jesus is the firstborn from the dead because his resurrection is a preview of the resurrection of all who place their faith in him. He is not only before salvation, he is the means of salvation. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus is before and he is the means of salvation. Uh, I have to mention that people see verse 20 as teaching universalism. That everyone will be saved in the end. That's what universalism teaches. Because Jesus reconciles all things to himself. But we have to remember that verse 20 is within the context of the new creation. Yes, this world is broken now. Yes, many deny Jesus' authority now. Yes, yes, that's all true. But one day, there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth where all things are reconciled to Jesus and there will be no more power struggles and there will be no more challenges to his authority and there will be no more accusations that threaten to divide and separate because the blood of Jesus brings perfect peace. And people try all sorts of different means to bring about salvation. It seems that we intrinsically know that we aren't right with God. And so we look for ways to solve that problem. I think we see this, people doing this all over the place. So, so many people are trying to be a good person. And if you ask them why, it's because they feel like they should, right? They, they, feel, they, they hope their good will outweigh the bad. And that is not a good plan. Because the one with the authority to define what is good says we aren't good and we can never be good on our own. But the good news of the gospel is that the one who is sovereign over all creation is also sovereign over our salvation. Jesus is not sitting in a lofty, heavenly position which he deserves, waiting for us to get our act together. He's not demanding that we pass a test that we've already flunked. No, that's not our God. He entered into our brokenness. The invisible God made himself visible. The fullness of God dwelled in Jesus as he went to the cross because the only way for us as sinners to make peace with the holy God was for the blood of a perfect lamb to cover all of our sins. We were created for him, but then he died for us. And not only, and, and he is not the only born from the dead. No, he is the firstborn from the dead. Through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, our sins can be forgiven and we can be reconciled to our creator. His resurrection is a preview of our future resurrection. Our relationship with Jesus can be restored. We can have peace with a holy God. I hope that just boggles your mind every once in a while, that that's even possible, that he loves me and I have peace with him. How, how can that be? It can be because Jesus is the means of my salvation, not me. That is such good news. He is also the ends. Don't miss the wording here. And through Jesus, to reconcile to Jesus all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his Christ. We are reconciled through Christ. He's the means. To Christ. He's the ends. He is the end goal of our reconciliation. People do all sorts of things to try to make their lives better. Uh, I think what you see is people trying to minimize the effects of our brokenness as humanity. So we know that we live in a fallen world, but we want to feel as whole as possible, right? But 
Our problem isn't ultimately with creation or with created things. Our problem is with our creator. We don't need to be reconciled to creation. We need to be reconciled to the creator. Why? Because creation is all about him. This this was all made for him. So, so you can pursue all sorts of different things. You can pursue the right amount of money or the right amount of popularity or the right amount of connections and influence or the right amount of relaxation. You can pursue all the things that you think you deserve and will make this world feel a little less broken to you. But all of those pale in significance to the importance of being right with Jesus and rightly worshiping him as superior to everything else because all authority belongs to him. He is more significant than anything that you give significance to. He holds together anything you are inclined to trust more than him. He has authority over everything that you fear more than him. Just just to summarize this text, this paragraph is telling us that Jesus is God. It's telling us that Jesus is more significant than everything else in creation. It's telling us that Jesus has authority over everything else in existence. It's telling us that Jesus holds together everything else in existence. And it tells us that Jesus' glorification is the purpose of everyone else's existence. And as Piper said, that's not egomania. That's love. Because in being made to amplify Jesus, we were made to amplify and exalt the glory of grace. The glory of peace making righteous blood being shed to cover guilty sinners' stains. The glory of the powers of darkness being conquered. The glory of a united spiritual family that shares in a heavenly inheritance. We were created to celebrate the superiority of Christ. And that is good news. Inexhaustible good news. And as I've studied this passage and all the characteristics of Christ that it reveals, I just keep thinking, man, what if we actually believe this? <laughs> like, there are so many major claims in this passage. I understand if you have to wrestle with them. I don't want you just to take my word for it. I want you to think through whether you really believe this. Because, man, if you do, I just feel like it would change so much. Right? Like, what if we really believe that all other powers are operating under Jesus' authority as creator. Would we stop freaking out so much about so many different things? I think, I think we would. What if we really believe that Jesus is holding everything together? Because some of us act like we are. Don't we? We act like we have to keep this world spinning. We have all these things that we're trying to keep balanced. What if we really believe that we were made by him and for him? We have a greater purpose for our existence than just doing what makes us happy in the moment and in the here and now. What if we really believe that Jesus deserves preeminent superiority, priority in everything? Would that change the way you live your life? I think it would change the way I live mine. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, We're coming to you because it's not enough for us to hear it. We need you to open our eyes to see Jesus for who he really is. We have to believe it. Because if we don't see his superiority and the centrality of him in everything, we don't have a chance. We don't have a chance. So I pray that we would truly believe That in everything, you deserve preeminence. That in everything, you deserve the glory. That in everything, you deserve the praise. I pray that we would believe that all authority is yours. That all sustaining power belongs to you. 
I pray that we would see that you are the head of this church. I pray that we would see that you are what makes God visible. So I just pray that we would submit to, our, to you today, that we would humble ourselves before you today. If there's anything in our lives that has taken priority over you, that we would lay that down at your feet and that you would once again be Lord over all. Every day, in every moment. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.